But even in the West, British and Americans exact full retribution for SS crimes. Allied troops escort a prisoner who is informed against camp guards. His identity is concealed. Fear of the Nazis will not die overnight. Yet even now, the Fuhrer is juggling improbable strategies for victory. He refuses to believe that his country lies in mortal peril. Insanely, he is convinced that massive counteroffensives in the East can still bring victory. But the armies to carry them out exist only in his imagination. And the Red Army is coming to shatter his illusions. Its great assault on Berlin is about to begin. Marshal Zhukov, never defeated in battle, will command Soviet forces. He is the Soviet Union's greatest military hero. He was the only one who could talk to Stalin without constraints. If Stalin was not right, say about some military issue or whatever, he was the only one who could discuss it with him or argue with him. At the beginning of April, Stalin and Zhukov meet in Moscow, preparing the final blow against Hitler. I was there when they were walking in the Kremlin. Stalin used to keep a step behind, and he put his arm round Zhukov and he said to him, you are my Suvorov, the great general who defeated Napoleon and never lost a battle. <laughs> but Stalin's paranoia and his mistrust of generals means that Zhukov can enter the Kremlin a marshal and leave moments later under arrest. And Zhukov is a prime candidate for such treatment. His uncompromising character and hints of independence have been known to prompt displeasure, even rage, in Stalin. The dictator knows that in this, the Soviet Union's vital hour of decision, he must have his most brilliant commander at his side. Nevertheless, as Zhukov prepares to take Berlin, NKVD agents are watching him. Habakumov, Beria, Kobolov, and Mekulov started to collect evidence against Zhukov after hacking Gol. They tried even harder after he became commander of Kiev military region and then head of general headquarters. They started filling the dossier against him at exactly that time. They followed everyone and any little incident, however minor, was added to the file. But Stalin's secret files are for later. Zhukov is safe for now, at least until Germany is beaten. The night of the 15th of April. 22,000 heavy guns announce the Red Army's offensive east of the German capital. Stalin claims he has six million men against less than a million armed remnants of every unit the Reich can muster. In the south, Konyev's first Ukrainian front breaks through at once to sweep round Berlin. In the north, Rokossovsky's second Belorussian front overcomes difficult terrain to take Mecklenburg. And in the center, Zhukov's great host grinds inexorably west towards a ruined Berlin still reeling under incessant air attack. Yeah. 
On the 19th of April, Soviet troops reach the Berlin suburbs. Now it is street fighting, house by house. Everyone a natural redoubt for desperate defenders. Casualties mount. Resistance stiffens, but the Soviet armies cannot be halted now. Hitler's Reich has been pierced to the heart. The apartments of high-ranking Nazi officials now lying directly in the path of Stalin's vengeful armies are shaken by the battle. Those who have prospered by Hitler's promises face the collapse of all they have believed in. Yet Hitler still lives. Prowling the bunker, he gloats over his photograph albums, celebrations of past glories. While his people pay the price of defeat, he celebrates the death of Roosevelt as a portent of victory. And imagines the imminent outbreak of war between the Allies. On the 25th of April, southern units of Konyev's front make contact with United States forces at the Elbe. No hint of future tensions here. With these happy scenes, Hitler's last fantasy evaporates. Commanders with Konyev's and Patton's armies hold a banquet to celebrate their momentous meeting. Steak and a special victory cake are on the menu, washed down with champagne and followed by toasts. Whiskey meets vodka. <laughs> 